I want to talk about Colin Wall because it's the 10th anniversary since he died in 2010. And strangely, for a man who was uh, a very quiet, self-effacing person, uh, he produced an awful lot of books. And his influence actually grows by the year. Every new generation has been discovering Colin Wall. And particularly this book, The Child in the City, which he published in 1978. Um, I don't think you'll go anywhere in the world or to any university where at some point in the year, in some planning department or architecture department, there'll be a seminar called The Child in the City. And it all, that very notion, takes its name from this completely influential book. Um, uh, himself, Colin, uh, was, as I say, very self-effacing. He had a very modest upbringing. He left school at 16. And, and in one of the little books he wrote called Talking to Architects, he had to give evidence to a commission on design. And he was asked actually who he was. And he said, well, I left school at 16 and I went worked on the drawing boards for, until I was the age of 40 for a number of architectural practices. He simply worked on the drawing boards. But in that kind of experience, he accumulated an enormous amount of insight into design and architectural issues, which gave him a kind of insider and outsider perspective on architecture and design particularly. Um, and I mean, he was erudite enough to write a book on the building of medieval cathedrals. On the other hand, and for my interest, he would, could also write uh, some of the most pioneering work on the French playgrounds. Uh, I suppose the other thing that people remember about him, which seems rather strange, is that he's probably also Britain's most famous anarchist. Uh, I can't think of any other people in post-war Britain, apart possibly from Herbert Reed or um, the man who wrote uh, The Joy of Sex, who Alex Comfort. Um, who kind of have quite the same, uh, or George Mellon, yes, uh, um, have quite the same public uh, persona. Um, so I, yeah, I'm losing myself. Am I still okay? Can people hear me? Yeah, you're all good. Sorry, someone okay. just started sharing their screen, so I stopped it. Okay. Um, so, yes, where, um, where was I? He, yeah. Um, so the, no, no, Britain's most famous anarchy. Uh, and he edited the journal, a magazine anarchy, from 1961 to 1970. And it really was a tremendous uh, publication. And of course, it, this was in the period of the 60s when there was a whole kind of set of new ideas around the world on how to change society, how to live. And I think in retrospect, most social historians would say the left didn't have really much to say, but anarchy magazine, uh, a small publication whose themes ranged across prison reform, adventure playgrounds, reform of education, housing policy, uh, uh, animal rights, uh, ecology, tremendously uh, diffuse and rich kind of array of essays. And he also founded, or well, this magazine uh, pioneered the work of a lot of people whose names eventually became very famous, people like Hugh Brody or Richard Navy, uh, and a number of others. So Anarchy magazine really was a kind of um, a tremendous uh, outpouring of new ideas, which I think one has to say, um, eventually when the magazine New Society opened up, a lot of its kind of interests and approaches, kind of libertarian, free-thinking, Catholic kind of approach to social life came through in New Society. And of course, Colin did work uh, regularly for New Society for many years. Uh, in 1971, though, he um, gave a full-time job as the education officer for the Town Country Planning Association. And a lot of people would think well, that's a bit of an oxymoron, an anarchist plan. But, um, is that not just Colin, but Peter Hall and a number of others have actually traced the origins of town and country planning to the anarchist movement of the 1890s. There was interest in kind of locality, regionalism, uh, forms of local, local economies, the interest in local economies. And so the, the idea that an anarchist planner 
is not quite as um, silly as it sounds. Um, and it was at the Town and Country Planning Association that with um, uh, Fyerson, Tony Fyerson, he did his first book, which was called, now this is not an oxymoron, it's kind of a bit of a paradox, well, I think it's tongue in cheek. His first book to an anarchist was called The Exploding School, um, which was uh, about how to dismantle the, the walls between the school and the world outside. And he uh, edited a magazine called Bulletin for Envir Bulletin Environment and Education, uh, which was uh, very widespread. And he encouraged schools to get their students to go out with cameras, uh, drawing, drawing instruments, and tape recorders to really work to see how the neighbourhood worked. And it was in that context of kind of environmental education I first met. And I, I have a very strong memory of that meeting because it happened in 1973, in the spring of 1973, when I went to an in service training course at the Centre for Urban and Educational Studies, QS, as a big um, in Islington, because I was then teaching English at a boys' school in Hackney, uh, Hackney Down School, which had four years previously transferred from being a grammar school. The comprehensive school. Obviously, the intake suddenly became very diff different. And the point of Ilya having these teacher centers, particularly specializing in urban studies, was to recognize and understand the changing, fast changing urban world in which teachers and students now found themselves, particularly the fact that it was a multicultural. Um, so, and the other thing that kind of um, made me uh, warm to Colin was at the talk today, he rhapsodized about the bench playgrounds. And, and in fact, um, this was a catnip to me and my wife because we had both worked on the bench playground in 1967 in Brighton, also one of the first um, adventure playgrounds in the country. And if I managed to um, show you a picture. I'll show you that. No, I'm not going to get there. Just hit desktop one and then share. Yeah. That's great. Uh -huh. Can you see that photo? Yeah. Can you see that photograph now? Yes. Did you see that photograph? Yeah. Okay. I can only see it in your finder, Ken. Yeah. I can just see the finder folder. So maybe when you share, yeah. there's, a, there's an option. Yeah, if you share, the first window is the desktop one, and then there's also an application folder, which should open. If you open it up in an application like preview, it should share that. It should show preview. Yeah, that's great. Can you see the photograph? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you look at the young woman on the left, holding the child's hand, that's Lorraine Wolf, oh. who is actually sitting in the room with me. So that's 1967. It's 53 years ago. Um, okay. So Apart from the interest in obviously a bench of playgrounds, which was very rich, um, there were, were, Colin and I discovered lots of common interests. And after that um, seminar, we started corresponding and we became very good friends for the rest of his life until he died in, in 20, uh, 2010. Um, so the Bulletin for Environmental Education really had an influence on what was happening in education. 
And, and I think, I mean, I know that there are quite a lot of young researchers now in various architectural departments around the world uh, and planning departments fascinated by this idea of an environmental educa education. And that Colin had actually done this so long ago. A few years ago, I attended the launch of the Farrell Report, um, I can't remember, probably about eight years ago, Max Farrell. And this was a, 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 a report into education for architecture in schools. And it was a very interesting presentation. And there was a, a junior conservative minister on the panel. And he said, um, this is all tremendously exciting. You know, children, young people going out and understanding the towns where they live and taking photographs. And I stood up and said, well, an anarchist actually had this idea 50 years ago. And, you know, it's still worth thinking about. Anyway, The Child in the City, uh, it was initially published by the Architectural Association, no, the Architectural Review, um, with a lot of beautiful photographs. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that one. I have um, this copy here. Um, and he read at the beginning, he was writing The Child in the City at the, 19th, at the time of the 1973 seminar, the way I met him. And he took our breath away because he opens the book with this um, short piece of memoir written by a man called Albert Carr, who was an American, who was then just retired as being the director of the National Museum for um, National Museum of Natural History in America. And I'm just going to read this is Albert Carr remembering a scene from his childhood. Not as a chore, but as an eagerly desired pleasure, I was fairly often entrusted with the task of buying fish and bringing it home alone. This involved the following, walking to the station in five to ten minutes, buying a ticket, watching a train with a coal burning steam locomotive pull in, boarding train, riding across Long Bridge over shallow, separating small boat harbour on the right from ship's harbour on the left including small naval base with torpedo boats, continuing through a tunnel, leaving the train at the terminal, sometimes dawdling to look at railroad equipment, walking by and sometimes entering Fisher's Museum, passing Central Town Park where military band played during midday break, strolling by Central Shopping and Business District, or alternatively, passing fire station with horses at ease under suspended harnesses, ready to go, and continuing past centuries old town hall and other ancient buildings. Exploration of the fish market and fishing free, finally selection of fish, haggling about price, purchase, return home. Well, uh, very exciting thing, but what's so special about that? But the fact is the denouement, as it were, or the reveal, is that he was only four years old when he, that, he remembers that happening, a four-year-old uh, going out to get the morning's fish involving a train journey and a walk through the dock. And for Colin, this notion that the child um, had this kind of agency, this, this love of being out there in the city is the kind of the key principle that informs the book. And I know that I had a discussion once with the historian Raphael Samuel, who, in, who you know, started out as a very, very, very hardcore Marxist, but towards the end of his life became much more sympathetic to the libertarian cause. And we were talking about Colin, and we agreed that looking back on the left in the 60s and 70s, um, whereas the left had kind of made the male industrial workers the kind of avatar or figurehead of the future world to come, the age of the future world to come. Colin's great contribution to anarchism was that he put the charm at the centre of social change. But if you couldn't make the world fit for the charm, then you weren't making it for the world. And this was, this was a tremendous kind of revival of that kind of anarchist spirit, that the charm the sovereign child with all his or her kind of interest, enthusiasm, openness to the world should be at the centre of public policy. 
Uh, another thing that is there in the original publication of the Chalmers City was a, uh, was a kind of photographic essay. And Colin was very much taken by street photography at the time. He was also taken by the work of the street photographer, uh, Roger Main. And again, that's coming around this time in the 60s. Children playing in the street becomes a kind of motif uh, all across Europe. It's, part, it's, it's the, the end of the war, there are bomb sites, and the child becomes this kind of, the child with the freedom of the street becomes very much a significant symbolic figure. Um, I want to step back a bit and trace Colin's relationship to what else was going on in Europe because there's a kind of push-pull thing going on in thinking about public space, thinking about child uh, in, in this period. And the starting point is, um, and I'm not going to try and mess around with think, is this book really, um, it's the original one, it's 1931, it's called Part it, 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 translation, it's part policies in country and town. It's by the very eminent Danish uh, landscape architect C. T. H. Sanderson. And this is the first book that kind of looks at the 20th century park in all its aspects, the sports park, the ornamental garden, the, the monumental park and so on, and, and understands this rich variety of park types and what role they play in social life. And Sorensen is someone who very early on thinks, and we may find this surprising now, that it's the English who've cracked it, that the, it's the English part that is with its kind of football games, kite flying, picnics, uh, liados, that is really uh, become the place of sociability. Uh, and that kind of, that's echoed also in another Danish visitor who comes to, who's in London actually at the same time as Sonson. And that's um, uh, like Steen Isla Rasmussen. Here we are here, which people say is the best book ever written about London. It's called London, the Unique City. What's interesting about it is that it's ostensibly about the architecture of London, but of the 13 chapters, uh, five of them are devoted to Park. And again, Rasmussen mentions this. He says what's distinctive about the London park is its kind of sociability, its, um, its rough and readiness, its openness to all kinds and conditions of people. It's not simply a place where you go and put your best clothes on. It's available for all kinds of enjoyable reasons. And then the third person, um, so Sorensen goes back uh, is back in Copenhagen and in 1943 he gets an idea for a new kind of children's space which is called Len, called the Junk Playground. It's located at Endra, which is a, uh, a neighbourhood to the north, of, a working class neighbourhood to the north of Copenhagen City. And Endra, this obviously would appeal to an anarchist, um, he has, it brings lots of old bits of brickwork and timber and panelling and nails and hammers. And the idea of the junk playground is that you get local builders or whatever, if they're demolishing or building to bring stuff they don't need anymore. And with that, young people create their own kind of mini neighbor. Uh, they create their own houses. Um, and in a way, you could say that's a very early example of that kind of architectural notion that the best architecture is, is a combination of loose parts, which the junk that playground clearly is. And in 1945, Lady Allen of Hartwood, who's married to a Labour peer in this country, goes over to Embrook, gets completely um, excited about bench playgrounds, and brings the idea back to Britain. And, and, from the, and then really in the 60s, the adventure playground movement takes off. Um, the third person is, um, is Dutch, and that's Aldo Van Eyck, who is a great hero of mine, and he was of, of Colin Wall. Uh, in 1945, the young, by the way, Aldo Van Eyck is actually educated in England. He was educated in London at the King Alfred School, which is a Progressive school, 
the Baldwin School, uh, where the headmaster spent most of his time writing a series of books about William Blake, which seems to me a very good thing for headmasters to do. Um, more interesting than some of the things they do if they're not writing or reading William Blake. Um, so he has this kind of progressive uh, English uh, education. But he gets a job uh, with the Amsterdam City Council in the architect's department in 1945. And he's seconded to the housing department. And he realizes that although uh, Amsterdam was very badly damaged during the war, surprising as it may seem, uh, and in fact, in the last winter, 1944, 1945, 20,000 Amsterdam has died of starvation. Uh, it's called the Hunger Games. So when Van I looked across at the problems facing Amsterdam in rebuilding itself, it had been occupied, there had been collaborationism, it was a very divided society. He said, well, I don't want to work on housing, I want to create spaces where people stop and start talking. So what he said was that he was going to design street corner playgrounds. He was to try and get a playground on every street corner in Amsterdam. So it would only be, it may only just be one sand pit and one piece of climbing. There might be some swings. It could be more quite elaborate, it could be very small. But it would be a place where parents and carers of young children would stop at least for 10 minutes and talk to each other. And uh, that 700 playgrounds actually became reality. Now I'm going to try again. This is the only other image I'm desperately keen to show everybody. Right. How do I blow this up? How do I? Um, share it. Share it. Share it. Yeah. What can you see? Um, we can't see it yet. Did you oh. click desktop one or the Yeah, under? yeah we got it. Uh, I can't see it, but I, you can. Well, that's... Um, that, well, it's, it said it was the... screen sharing. Um, Sorry? Are we there? No, can not you yet. See? Um, maybe head back and then and then try again. I think you have to share the application window, Ken, instead of the desktop one. Oh. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, it's set in 1961 at the top left-hand corner, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, there was an exhibition of uh, Aldo Van Eyck's playground project uh, at the State Life Museum in 2002. And this just kind of almost brought me to tears, this image. Um, it's little lights on a map of Amsterdam, and each light shows one of the playgrounds that he designed. And it's called The Starry Night, and it's named after the Van Gogh painting. And this was kind of Van Eyck's idea of a liberated city, that it had all the kind of spaces and the illumination of... Um... Well, having successfully done that, I'm going to do one more then. Do you see that? Not yet. I think if you um, if you stop sharing and then share again, 
might reset it. Yeah. Right, I'm going to forget that. Um, so then I, you know, it, it's, it's tremendously important for this notion of the playground actually being the kind of the, the glue of, of the city. Um, now, I want to kind of come to a conclusion because about this notion of the child in the city. Um, why I think Northern Europeans particularly strong, and particularly the Netherlands, is that, uh, and, and again, this is a discussion I had with Colin, uh, everybody knows the famous bridal painting, which is the um, children's game. Uh, but there was actually a genre of Dutch painting, which was all was about children's games. It came later than bridal. And in uh, part of that generic tradition was that the children were always painted or portrayed as playing outside the town hall. And this was because, in a way, play was seen as the beginnings of civility. Play was being out on the street, playing in the street, was seen as the beginning to becoming a citizen of the town or the city. And when we were training to be teachers, I mean, we all had to study a book by the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget called The Moral Judgment for the Child. But it is about uh, the role of play in creating morality, particularly civic morality. He said that because he said there are two elements, well, there are more than two elements, but two of the important elements of play are firstly, everybody has to agree the rules. You can't have games, you can't play successfully without everybody agreeing the rules and then sticking by them. Otherwise, any game uh, just falls into falls to pieces. And secondly, intrinsic to the game was the notion of fairness. Um, that everybody should have a turn in some way or another. And so this notion of, and it's there in Colin's book, the play, playfulness is how the child kind of experiences the world and how we should try to design uh, towns and cities. And finally, Colin always, well, nearly always, ended his talk with why do so many architects and designers and politicians and planners forget play? And he said, well, it's because play leaves no traces. It doesn't leave buildings behind. It doesn't leave ruins behind. It doesn't leave transformations in the landscape behind or transformations in the street behind. It magics into being one morning, children play, they play on the beach, they play in the woods, they create a game, it happens, there's no infrastructure, it's an imaginative world, it has its own rules, and at the end of the game, it disappears, it leaves no trace. And he said, this is the kind of, this is the, the, the strange thing about play, it's kind of presentness, it, it's, it's now. And when asked uh, what really uh, kind of typified his anarchism or his politics. He said, we must never sacrifice the present for the future. Most of what we want in life, even the life we think might be the best sort of life possible to have, is actually here. Most of it. And sometimes all of it is here in our lives, depending on the circumstances in which we happen to be at that time in our lives. And it, it's this kind of, I hate to use this word interrogation, but it's this kind of understanding of the present that really should inform the way we think about the world. And for them, for him, the child playing in the street, the child playing, or the children playing games in the streets, the city, really was the, the new world, or the better world, now already here. So that's my talk about the war. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, so if anyone has questions, you can pitch them in the chat. Um, firstly, I'm, I mean, I've got a question um, just quickly. 
um, about um, how, like, because we're all using, we're having to stay inside more, like children are kind of being forced to play um, out on the street more. Kind of, what do you, um, I was, there's a kind of interesting thing of how um, children might have like, a, might remember this summer as like having a, a fear of proximity or um, going into public spaces, but they might remember the summer as a, a summer they played out on the streets and I don't know, what do you think about? Well, I'm very glad you asked me that question. This is not a rhetorical device because yesterday I was talking to my almost neighbour, the architect Richard Hill, at proper social distance. Um, and he said, well, of course, uh, Colin Ward or Alder and I would have loved for the chalking on the pavement. In yeah. fact, Moraine and I went out this morning to photograph um, the chalked pavement. So unfortunately, I mean, I've got them on somewhere, but you can see I'm not very good at finding things. Um, but the fact is that children have been out there in the absence of the cars and possibly being now freer than the adults who are supposed to be supervising them. And they have been reclaiming the pavement and the street. And I think this terrible kind of lockdown situation which we find ourselves, which is likely, I suspect, to lead to us older folk being the last to be allowed out of their front doors. But the, the young ones, the, the four-year-olds, may yet kind of be jumping on buses on their own and, uh, and uh, going shopping on their own and bringing the shopping back to their grandparents um, in the light of what's going to happen. So I think, you know, there, there has been a significant change. And I have hardly seen it because I don't go really to the end much more to the end of my road. But from what I understand, there's significant change in the way people are using roads and streets and pavements and so on. And, and obviously parks have played an incre incredibly important part. So what's left of, kind of the public sociability at the moment? So I think it, what is everybody is saying in, in the newspaper, we either use this terrible situation, but we use it productively, to change things for better afterwards. And I think in, if we hope to do that, and can do that, then certainly this notion of opening uh, the city to children, young people again, is going to be very, very important. Um, okay, so we've got a question from um, Roman. I'm gonna unmute you now, so you can pitch it. Um, great, hopefully you can hear me, Ken. Hello, Roman, hello. Hi. And that was fascinating to hear about Carlton City and it made me think about Colin's um, interest in Peter Kropotkin and his ideas around mutual aid. And so I'm wondering what do you think Colin would have thought about the kind of outbreak of mutual aid in communities during the current pandemic? And what kind of political potential would do you think he would see in this mutual aid, particularly the the potential to revive a grassroots democracy in counter to the rise of far-right populism. I'm, 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 yes, I'm sure he would. Uh, he would, you know, find you know that the way that people have reacted to this situation has not been in panic or in selfishness or in kind of you know pulling down the shutters on their own lives. It has been a kind of seems to have been an outpouring of people helping each other, particularly intergenerational help. Although obviously, kind of grandchildren and grandparents are not simply allowed to meet anymore. Um, but where I live, we live in you know flats um, overlooking Crystal Park, and it, it's a bit like a kind of Red Vienna around here, I have to say. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, it's it's a tremendous um, richness of kind of self help uh, and people helping each other and, and you know really really um, tremendously tremendously impressive and and it does again confirm Colin's belief that actually pre you know the changed present is always here he, well he used the image of the it's the sea beneath the snow. It's once you clear the snow, 
the seeds are there. It's already, you know, it's nearly here. Yeah. Um, is that a question from Ben? Or just a, a book recommendation? Should I unmute you, Ben? Oh, just a note. <laughs> Um, okay, so does anyone else have any questions? You can just unmute yourselves if you want to. I can. I thought that was a really interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering if you have any kind of contemporary practices that you look um that you are looking to that are kind of like in line or you believe are kind of aspirational that um, are kind of doing this kind of play with children and kind of bringing kind of um urban planning into kind of the forefront that's kind of a really complicated question but that's where i'm kind of thinking <laughs> um well no but i it, um about five years ago i went to a, uh, one of these Salzburg Global Seminars, which was, it was called, by the way, The Child in the City. Um, and there were, there were play workers and architects and planners from all around the world, literally. And there were, there were two young women, one was from Beirut and the other was from Mexico City. And uh, they said uh, that the absolute essential for them was to, to map where children currently exist in play, uh, where could play currently existed. And the woman from Mexico said, uh, against what we would normally think, if you found all the playgrounds in Mexico City, they were only in the wealthy areas. There were no playgrounds in the poor areas. And even that simple visual representation of where facilities or opportunities are, are is, is a very powerful instrument in, in kind of um, in, in alerting politicians to, uh, you know, things that have gone missing. I mean, it, I know it's in planning documents that, you know, ostensibly people are only supposed to live, you know, 400 yards from so much open space. It's always been in a rather, that, that way of representing kind of access to public space always seems to me rather arid, whereas mapping and visualisation visualization of a neighbourhood, where the opportunities are for congregation or sharing or playing, uh, it is a very powerful tool. As, as of course, uh, a kind of but a big problem um, is, is the, the way in which schools particularly on Saturday, primary schools, have now turned into fortresses against the outside world. I mean, the school I used to teach in, uh, the only, uh, where I was four years at Handy Down School, uh, which is opposite, literally Handy Down, hence its name. And if I'm in really fine weather, I occasionally would take a class over and sit on the grass and do the English lesson there. Um, if I cycled past Handy Down School now, it has an eight foot high kind of wire fence around it, entry phone, entry only. And the school is absolutely kind of sealed off from the neighborhood. And the idea, which we used to do, which was, and was kind of part of the, the bulletin of environment education approach, was to get the students, you know, 14 year olds, give them little pocket cameras, send them out for the morning go down to the river they take photographs or uh, go somewhere else take photographs and then write a story about it. So the idea of letting school children now um, in, uh, in the neighborhood or environment is now kind of it, it's it's completely impossible partly for that partly because of the national curriculum but partly because of what education has become which is kind of an example Sorry, um, I've got a question from Gareth. I'm just going to unmute you. Gareth? Um, thank you. Um, so, so my question was just uh, thinking about uh, one of Colin's other books and the only one that I've actually 
uh, read in its in entirety. Um, wh what do you think this pandemic means for the uh, chances of um, a, a post-motor age arriving? Uh, well, strangely, I mean, uh, not many people know that, but do you know that Colin wrote a book about um, British lorries? Um, he was like Ireland. I am. He was a great admirer of the pre-war lorry manufacturing in Britain. He admired the engineering completely. I just adored it. Um, so he wasn't absolutely against the car. Um, but obviously the, the Tampa Country Planning Association, you know, th their idea uh, of trying to create communities where the car was not dominant um, would, would have been his. I think the other big idea that is coming back very strongly is over the issue of land pricing in the city and what uh, land pricing can do, where actually, because of the cost of land now, prohibits the majority of the social facilities ever happen. In fact, you can only now have a doctor's surgery if you've got five stories of flats above it, or you can only have a health centre if it's on the corner of a big residential private development. You can't have the social amenity in its own right because of land prices. And I think, the Ebenezer Howard notion of the land trust, the community land trust, uh, in which the land is owned by the community and therefore any improvement uh, which, uh, and uh, rise in the, its values which accrue from development are then used to fund common facilities rather than going into the hands of the spectrum. I think this is uh, one of the, you know, the long tradition of from everything from Howard onwards, which is partly an anarchist, anarchist uh, notion of holding the land in, in trust, uh, is, is coming back quite strongly because she, simply because of the sort of the ridiculous um, way in which speculation now, speculation now determines the shape and look of cities, not public policy or not human priorities. Okay, Lauren's got a question. I'm going to unmute you now, Lauren. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I just had a question on the back of Gareth. Um, I just read in the news that uh, a city in Italy, Lombardy, is going to convert 35 kilometers of street to um, cycling and, and walking space uh, this summer. So it's going to be a rapid roll out of that. Um, and I imagine this is not, it's not quite the same as, you know, having these pocket parks or having parks near, uh, on every corner, but it will help, um, return some, some land to, to the public realm. Um, I just was curious, Ken, what your, what your views are on this decision. Um, that is very much a top down decision. Uh, I can't really say it's very anarchic, <laughs> uh, but what this, yeah, just your views on the decision and whether other cities should be should be following Lombardi's lead. Yeah, I think what's what has happened in part public part policy in the last twenty years has been the move um, away from seeing a, a town or city's parks as a kind of uh, a set of uh, um, self-contained spaces. Uh, absolute kind of belonging to a neighborhood uh, and but not connected to each other to the notion of that all green space somehow in the, in the future city or the modern city should be connected so that there are corridors that people can travel more easily through the city by cycling or walking and also these corridors will be much more amenable to wildlife and stock but there's always been a there's always been a kind of classic problem about the traditional neighbourhood part in that uh, people obviously rightly get very attached to it and very proprietary about it. And they, they often don't like strangers coming into their park. Uh, and, you know, in, my, in the local park, which I can actually see as I look to the right out here, uh, cycling in the park is a very contested activity. Um, because it's a conflict between 
obviously pedestrians and cyclists, but it's a conflict not simply between two different modes of transport, it's two, through two very different uses of space. One is which is for mobility, and the other is for sanctuary. And these are kind of in conflict. Uh, and that's, a pro that's an issue that uh, we can solve in various ways, or that we'll never properly solve it, but time, time use, you can have different times in which certain kind of activities are allowed. And it could be that, you know, parks that have now been connected up through cycle routes might only be, you know, cycle friendly from 8 in the morning to 10 in the morning or 7 in the morning, something like that. But use time management to kind of shape or arrange how people use different places. Because there always are these conflicts in public space. And particularly that these conflicts are going to get worse or more exacerbated, if you like, if more people uh, work from home, the car is less used, but they, on the other hand, the site is more used. This conflict between sanctuary and the ability is going to, I think, become something that's going to need a lot more thought. Can I just say, um, really, I am just amazed. I, my brother in America is now on the screen. I can't believe it. Um, <laughs> all my friends, all my friends are there. Do you want to do a shout out? <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got another we've got a few more questions and I think we should wrap up. Um, so we've got a question from Savannah. Hello. Um, I actually have a few questions if you don't mind. So um, my name is Savannah and I currently live in Palestine, which is um, I'm sure most of you guys know it's occupied by um, Israel. And I'm wondering, like, what can a city do that uh, is very limited in terms of space due to population growing and occupiers taking more space? Um, what can a city like us do in order to, because um, I'm an urban studies major, and for my senior project, I'm redesigning one of the cities that I'm living in um, into um, a child-friendly city. But I'm having some complications in doing so due to, as I said, limited space and, like, we have some issues due to playgrounds not being very clean, uh, waste being all over the place. But like, what else can we do um, to kind of include and integrate the children in the city when you don't have so much space to do so? Things are very tight and cramped. And like, also trauma. What can we also do to help the children with trauma in terms of play, right? So I'm just wondering like, um, like you said something about reclaiming pavement in the streets, like so we can use stuff like chalk, maybe do hopscotch, like that allows them to have play, for instance, when they're going to school. But what else can be done for these children? Well, I guess what, what, another thing we haven't talked about really, I mean, except with the um, exception of the event playground, is the role of play work. Um, we used to call them unattached youth work or play work. And as important in a way to the adventure playground movement as the construction, the structures, the use of old materials and so on, were the fact that they all had paid workers who could be, you know, support, they could provide a bit of counselling if necessary, they could just simply be a regular figure that children who were lost or bunking off the school or troubled at home could sit and have a chat with and so on. Um, and that, I mean, it's a different thing to that kind of um, all notion of the, the self-imagined world of play, which the children are wholly self-organising. That there are occasions when they need uh, a lot of them. I suspect it's obviously true where you are. There are very few untraumatised adults around, or adults who they are trustworthy who they could talk to and i think play work i mean we have you know got rid of so many youth works and play work and i think we're paying the price for it. Uh, so i think um the mapping is very important because it's the easiest way of demonstrating scarcity of provision or non-existence of provision and i think the budget for play work and the kind of training that 
playwright that could or should have has enabled us of young people to talk about some of their most difficult problems it is going to, it is very important as well um am i allowed to reply yeah or... yeah okay um so for my senior project i ask children to um draw their imagined like pathway to school and so due to the coronavirus i couldn't ask that many children but the few that i've been able to ask they have no idea what they want on their pathway because they've never seen anything other than what they have now in their cities which is um there's no green space we don't have many green spaces we don't have much room for play we don't have many things so the only things that i got back from feedback of like what to draw are things like like they put flowers and maybe a bunny or like a dra a dragon things they don't really know actually exists in other cities you know like um they don't have the um i guess you could say like for instance kids in the west like okay i grew up in the us so and i moved to palestine a few years ago so i'm able to understand what a city should have like what elements a city should have a city sh city should have um to make it kind of healthy but my little sister grew up here so she has no idea what elements a city, a city should have you know neither do her friends um so how can you kind of like design a city because I'm trying to design a city based off of the children and what they want. But if they don't know what a city even is and what a city needs to have in it, how can you design the city? And as for trauma and like adults, um, um, psychology or like mental health issues here aren't accepted. So they have to be suppressed. And most children like release it through play, but we don't have areas to play. So like, it's just like, for me, it's very complicated to find a solution to this kind of a thing. I'm trying to find like small ways you can integrate play in a city like this, but it's very hard in doing so, you know, and I'm asking like, what are the smallest things that I could do that could really make a difference to these children? I think well, the, the question you raise is not a question simply about play and children. It's a, it's a, it goes to the heart of um, architecture and, and how people relate to architecture because um, I've done quite a lot, lot of work here with public libraries and, and when you look at the consultation, there have been a generation of new libraries around the world actually. When you look at the consultation processes sometimes, uh, what people have been asked for is they want the same library as they had but slightly more better. They've never seen what a completely different library could be like. And I think this question of when you are a consultation which simply asks people what they want without giving them the experiences of the, of the really rich range of things that could be by going to other places um, it, it is, is a big issue. I mean we don't really know what um, if you have if you you know if you haven't seen some of them at, you know Canada Waterline which I love um, you don't know what uh, you know, an amazing new library could be as a meeting place, a social centre, a kind of place where young people will, you know, really enjoy being and feel themselves to be legitimated by the library because they're welcome there, they're properly treated with respect. If you haven't seen that, you might go into another dull library and they may have a consultation like, what would we want uh, to make it better? And people simply say, oh, we want it just simply, you know, painted white and something else but if you haven't seen a completely different model of something you're looking for then you you'll be restricted in what your imagination allows you to 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 see so i think this question of well it's going, it's going to be hard for you to take your children or young people out of palestine to other places to see what could be done but I think there, you know, there needs to be much more sharing of um, different models or experimental models of, of how provision can be achieved. Okay. Um, I'm just going to give the last question to um, Alicia. Alicia. Hello. Oh. Hang on. Hang on. Hello. Hello. Hi, um, hi, Colin. Hi there. Um, 
yeah, um, I can't really remember my question. So um, um, I think it's Rose, you might have to read it out. It's more about the sort of politics of Colin's work, because of course, um, all these little seeds under the snow we know have already existed, but what do you think will have to change sort of, you know, more structurally and politically for the sort of anarchic vision that Colin shared with us all to actually happen? Oh, um, well, carry on, yeah. Well, it, I mean, it's just that I suppose, um, you know, while we're living under sort of neoliberalism, all these little pockets of anarchic um, activity are sort of still at the margins. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how we can work towards sort of getting them more normalised. Well, I've always been struck by the, um, uh, the the lack of interest in local government by um, people on the left. I mean, I'm on the left, so let me call people on the left. Yeah. Um, the, the kind of, you know, the, the, the very left people want to seize the centre of power, which is who, who wants to sit in Downing Street? And you can't do anything with that. But I mean, in local government, you can do lots of things. You can do lots about housing, the parks, and everything. And why, why is politics obsessed with uh, the national rather than local? And through the local, you can get to the global as well. I mean, yeah. politics in Hackney is international, absolutely much more international than Western. So it, it, I do think that, you know, we have to reinvigorate uh, local government. And I think local government has been doing some very important work that, that whenever any party, or all the political, major political parties pay lip service to their belief in local government and to localism, as soon as they gain power, the first thing they do is kind of further restrict the budgets spent and, uh, and, the, and the powers of local government to do anything vaguely different from that which is paid for and legislated for in the national state. So there's so little room for movement locally because of the constraints imposed by national government. And I think we've got to shift that. Um, okay, I think we're going to um, wrap up, but thank you so much, Ken, that was totally fascinating. Um, I especially thought the Q&A was really good, and um, I'm going to unmute everyone so everyone can give Ken a round of applause. Yeah, so you can change that. Ken! Thanks, Ken! Okay. See you soon. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>